the theme of this class is kind of all the things that nobody ever told you about the print process that are important and that help you get that perfect print. And then at the end, uh, as promised in the email, we will go through and kind of put all this to work and go through a step-by-step -step printing in, in Lightroom and or Photoshop. So feel free to uh, post your questions over on the side. I know we get a lot of questions on this, so we'll, we'll kind of have to pick and choose as we go through, but um, let's get this kicked off. So I started out um, with Moab almost a decade ago now, and I create all the profiles and, and do all our support and demos and training and everything else. I actually, I was lucky enough to grow up with a darkroom. So I, from, I think by the time I was three years old, I was out uh, pushing the print button for my dad and watching the, the images appear in the, in the developer tray. So that was, that was a lot of fun. And I fell in love with photography and, and have never looked back. And, and it's such a, as all of you know, cause you're watching this, it's such an opportunity to, to capture what's around us and, and make beautiful images. And, and most importantly, to be able to print and, and share these with the world. So what are we going to do today? Well, today we're going to talk about mastering the print process. We're going to make sure that you uh, make friends with your printer and don't just leave it shut in the closet, powered off. We're going to give you the tools to evaluate the prints that you make, talk about uh, color management and that process, talk a little bit about paper, and then putting all this together to, to expand your creativity and get you guys going. And I see we already have a question here popping up about some color management things. So I think we're going to kind of get to that through this. And like I said, if there's, this is, this is as much a, a conversation as a presentation. So if you want a little clarification, or if you have another question, just put it up there. We'll, we'll try to get to it. And then as Paige mentioned under the files tab, you can download, it's about a five page PDF of notes from this class that'll kind of should cover most things. So you don't have to be furiously uh, writing away as we're going through it. So even with the proliferation of, of iPads and phones and everything else, you know, when you go into a gallery or you go into a museum or whatever else, you still see prints on the wall. And, and that's because we, we value a relationship with, with physical objects as people. And we get to have these photographs. We print them on our wall. And every time you walk by a photograph that you've printed, you, you remember the time or the place or the emotion or it, it speaks to us. And, and that, to me, is the real value of printing. So where do we start? Well, the best thing you can do is start with the best image file. Hopefully most or all of you are uh, shooting raw files on your cameras. That's absolutely the best thing that you can do because you are basically starting with a digital negative. And then when you're editing in Lightroom or in Photoshop, you want to be using the Adobe RGB or the Profoto RGB color space. Um, people have their opinions on which one is better, but the bottom line is that both of them are better than sRGB which is just used for the web. It's the smallest amount of colors. Um, so if you're using Photoshop Camera Raw, those settings are down at the bottom of the Camera Raw window, and then you choose your, your color space. And if you're in Lightroom, they're in Preferences, and you need to do it in the um, External Editor Preferences and in the Export Preferences, because like I said, Lightroom defaults to sRGB. And why... Do we not want to use sRGB? In this graph, the solid is sRGB. The wireframe is Adobe RGB. And the difference between those is colors that would just be excluded. So a color space is the mathematical shape of all the colors available to us. So the bigger the color space, the more potential colors we can have in our image file, which gives us more colors in our output. And somebody said, will we cover soft proofing? We absolutely will. That comes a little farther on. So uh, a lot of people, when I teach these classes, say, well, you know, my house is a little small and, and I'm not sure where I'd put a printer. I currently live in my home with 19 printers, uh, the largest of which is this Canon Pro 4000. And, uh, you know, for a size reference, it's, it's not small. But I, I bring this up because... Ink can be seen as the most expensive part of the print process. Um, so what you're going to do is when you first get your printer out, you're going to sit down and, and you know, it's, it's like our relationships. We don't, 
we don't fall in love usually overnight and, and get married. And it's, we, we, we have to date a little bit. So you're going to be dating your printer. You're going to buy it a drink. You're going to buy it a little ink. You're going to sit down. You're going to get to know each other. And, you know, maybe you'll have a misunderstanding here or there, but at the end of the process, you'll be good friends and, and, and your printer will help you create wonderful art. Um, and the biggest thing too, is as you work through this is take notes back in the darkroom days, we didn't have metadata and, and all this stuff that hangs around with our pictures. We had to write down everything we did so we could go back and reference it. So as you're, as you're learning and as you're working through the print process, you know, what works, what media setting did I use? What color profile did I use? What print setting, low, medium, or high did I use? All that sort of thing. So don't, don't hesitate to take notes. And if you get a print that you've been struggling with that comes out looking fantastic, all you have to do is put another piece of paper, hit the button, print it again. And on one of those, write down everything you did on the back so that you have a good reference point of when you come back a month or two months or three months later, hopefully it's not three months, to make another print, you have your little cheat sheet there that you knew, hey, this worked really well for me. Because even I forget if I start something and four days later I come back, I'll look at what's on my desk and I think, well, I don't remember what I was doing. And, you know, I print just about all the time. So the biggest thing is, do these prints that you make look good to you? I have a lot of people that when we do demos, will bring in their prints and say, well, what do you think? Well, I think it looks great, but we print for ourselves for the fulfillment of our artwork and our, our creative outlet and, and all that sort of thing. So if the print looks good to you, you've nailed it. There's, there's not really a holy grail in printing that we all have to uh, aspire to. So the question is, how do you know the print looks good for you? So the best thing you can do to start is work in a space with neutrally colored walls. You can kind of see behind me, it's kind of an off-white wall. And we do that because if you work in a room that has a very vibrant paint color, it's actually going to shift your perception of white one direction or the other. So what will look good in that room that you're working in, the minute you carry your computer to the other room or make a print or go outside, suddenly your, your colors don't look quite right. So work in a neutral space as much as possible. Uh, the second one is have a light source independent of daylight that's consistent for evaluating your prints. Even in my house, as the sun tracks morning to evening, the color of the light inside our house changes, whether it's morning and it's reflecting off the trees, or it's midday and it's pretty blue or that sort of thing. So you want to have a good light source. And what do we mean by a good light source? Either a good old um, halogen bulb or a high quality LED bulb. And what you'll see a lot on, on light bulb packaging now at the, at the store is something that's the CRI, Color Rendering Index. And what that tells you is what percentage of the visible spectrum that light bulb creates. Because in order to see a color on the printed page, that wavelength has to be able to be reflected by the inks. So as an example, a halogen bulb is hot because it creates infrared that's outside the visible spectrum that we feel is heat. But because of that, it fills the entire visible range of light. Um, at the bottom of this graph, an 80 CRI LED means that it is 80% of the visible spectrum. So you're missing reds and you're missing blues. And so if you're using a a light bulb that you don't know the quality of or or that you just had to run out and buy quickly because something burned out, you might be missing a lot in your prints. So some of these nicer LED bulbs can be $20, $30, um, but you only have to buy one and they do last an extremely long time. There's a company based in California called Sora that makes very good LED bulbs. And not only can you, you spec your beam angle, but you can also get your color temperature. So 2,700 degrees is a very warm white, 3,000, 4,000, cooler white, 5,000 is daylight. So for, for print review, usually 3,000, somewhere around 3,000 is good because you figure most people are going to be looking at prints inside a house. And so you want that print to look good with a sort of an incandescent warmer white bulb. If you want to be really exact and match everything up, you would use a 5,000 degree bulb, but then you're relying on the fact that all your lighting in your house might be gallery lighting or something like that. So whether it's a halogen or whether it's a, a high CRI LED, get yourself a, a reliable light source that's the same morning, noon, and night to look at your uh, to look at your prints. 
And Evan, maybe you're going to get to this um, coming up, but we do have a question. Um, do you calibrate your monitor to the paper's brightness and tone manually? Ah, uh, yes. So sometimes this is a question that comes up. You actually don't ever calibrate your monitor to the paper because then you could, well, I suppose I take that back. You could, but then you would only ever print on that paper. So you'll calibrate your monitor to a, a specific standard and then adjust the brightness and you should be all set. And we'll get to that in a few slides. And I think somebody's also asking about monitor color spaces and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So you're working with neutral wall color, you have consistent lighting, and, and now you know that whatever you print out, you can, you can trust your eyes and trust what you see because you've given yourself the best review capabilities. All right, so jumping into color management. Evaluate your prints under consistent lighting. Number two, calibrate your display. And, and some people ask, well, why do I need to calibrate my display? Well, it's, it's critical because the signal that the computer sends out to the screen, it knows what it's sending out. It has no idea how you're seeing it. Your screen could be black and white. And if the computer is sending it a color signal, it has no idea that you're seeing things in black and white. So what calibration does is you put a device on your screen that reads a bunch of different color patches and says, oh yeah, that yellow is correct. Or that green, it's a little too forest green. We got to make it a little more, you know, golf course green. And when that process is done, you know that every color that you see on the screen is what the software thinks you're seeing. And it's the numbers in the file. We have to think in digital of color as number. So a, a 255 or a, sorry, a 125 green on your screen needs to be a 125 green in the print. And if your monitor is calibrated, then you know that what you see on the screen is actually what's in the file. And somebody asked if my monitor has a limited gamut. So what that means is laptop monitors, um, they're better now than they used to be. And other inexpensive monitors, if we go back to the color space that we talked about, every screen will be able to show you sRGB, that smallest color space. Um, fancier monitors will give you what they call 99% of Adobe RGB. So almost that full larger color space that we looked at. So there's a function in Lightroom, if you use Lightroom, that you can turn on, and, and this will be in our soft proofing section, that it will actually show you if there are colors in your file that you're not seeing correctly on your screen. Because if you're doing a lot of work on a laptop, there may be blues and greens and, and reds that are present in your file that you might even see on the print, but that won't look the same on the monitor. So if you're calibrating, no matter what screen you have, you are doing your best to guarantee that what's on your screen matches what comes out on your print. So this is the only time that we will advocate uh, purchasing something in this talk, and, and that something is a monitor calibrator. And, and if you have a, you know, a, a couple of photographer friends that live close by, granted it's harder these days, but I used to say you could always buy one and then, you know, share it, make somebody dinner and they bring over the monitor calibrator. But I guess these days it's uh, <laughs> it's buy a calibrator for yourself. Um, the X-Rite, the i1 Display Studio is generally all the calibrator you would ever need. I think they're somewhere around $150, $160, depending on what the sale is but they're pretty straightforward to use and the software walks you through most of the settings. And then the other thing you can do is if you work in a room that has uh, a big windows or a lot of directional light, you can make yourself a little monitor hood and that helps isolate what you see on your screen from all the other light in the room and, and helps keep the colors a little more accurate. Um, it doesn't matter what paper you're printing on in terms of how you calibrate your monitor what you're going to do is in that software, it's going to give you a recommended brightness for print. It's the number is 160. And so you'll select that, you'll finish the process. And then the best thing to do is to, you know, maybe make a small print of a file that you're familiar with and kind of compare them. Because if the, the colors are going to be accurate, no matter what, because the job of the monitor profile and the output profile is to ensure that. But what a lot of people struggle with is brightness because every year, monitors get brighter. Um, we haven't been able to make paper any brighter for quite a while. So you'll find yourself increasingly darkening your monitor to match your prints. Now, there's nothing wrong with 
after you working on your photos to turn the monitor brightness back up to do your email or your web searches or, or whatever else. Just make yourself a little note that says, hey, turn the brightness back down to whatever the setting was before you go back and, uh, and, and do more printing. Um, and Evan, do you um, recommend spider calibrators? You know, I haven't worked with them in a long time. So I think that if, if that's available at your local store or if you have one, you know, go for it. There's, there's no downside. I'm just most familiar and we do a lot of work with, uh, with x right So. Cool. And then one more question. Um, do you set your screen display profile to pro photo or Adobe RGB? So your display profile is what you're going to use this calibrator for. Um, you wouldn't set it to, uh, an Adobe RGB or a pro photo RGB cause that's a color space and that's going to be the hardware part of the monitor. So that's not something that you can control. And there's no monitor out there yet that does more than Adobe RGB. Um, I think because we just don't have the technology or it's far too expensive or a little bit of both. So if you're looking for a higher end monitor like the BenQ or the Azo or the NEC, uh, you're looking for something that says full RGB, Adobe RGB or 99% Adobe RGB. And they usually have uh, photography oriented monitor categories. And one more question. Um, does the room have to be dark when you're calibrating your monitor? Uh, it, it doesn't. I, if the sun is shining on your screen, I wouldn't calibrate it then. You know, I'd, I'd wait for that to pass. But average ambient light is is not a problem for a monitor calibrator. It kind of sits against the screen and sort of seals off the, the sensor so it doesn't get a lot of incident light from, from outside. And somebody's saying, if I make the screen brightness, what the calibrator suggests, the screen looks too dark. And, and that's entirely possible. The, the double check for that is to make a print and see if that print really matches your screen. Because that's the telltale sign that, hey, I've got my monitor set to the right brightness. So we've calibrated our displays. Next is to use an ICC profile or a color profile when printing. And this is what we'll also call an output profile because it's the profile that you apply when printing, when outputting your image. So there's a unique color profile for every paper on every printer, which makes me responsible for quite a few profiles. Um, these profiles tell the printer how to mix inks to make the colors that we expect. You can make your own profiles. Um, Generally, unless you really want to jump into color science and become a bit of a color nerd, I don't necessarily recommend it because there are a lot of components that go into making a profile besides just printing and scanning the, the little targets. And surprisingly enough, you also generally want to use a profile for black and white printing because that profile knows the black point of the paper, the white point of the paper, the, the underlying, is it warm tone, is it cool tone? And on our modern inkjet printers, when you're making a black and white print, the printer is generally mixing in some color inks as well to expand the shadow and the highlight detail. And you don't see it when you're looking at the print, but there's usually some cyan and some yellow that gets mixed in with the black inks so that it looks accurate. So even though it is a, a black and white print to the printer, it's technically a, a color print. So what does the profile do? This is a print made without any profile applied. And this is the print with the profile. Not sure how well this comes across the internet, but you can see the first one without a profile is kind of dull and, and not very interesting. And the second one with the profile, suddenly all those colors look right. The sandstone looks orange and the uh, strawberries look red and the sunset looks, looks nice. So we provide color profiles for all of our papers for pretty much every current photo printer, current and past photo printer that's out there. You navigate to our website and, and download them. And, and this is something you only have to do once. So if you're, if you're starting with our sample box or a, a new paper, you go to moabpaper.com, download the profile. This is where once you download it, you have to install it into a specific folder. And once you've moved it into that folder, it's, it's there for good. You don't have to re-download this every time you want to print. And um, Evan, would it be um, a separate ICC profile for a black and white uh, photo as opposed to a color? It wouldn't. You're actually going to use the same profile whether you're doing black and white or color printing. There are some things that allow you to make a specific black and white profile, but in this, um, in this talk, we don't get into that because that's kind of 
two levels up and and something that you you'll just do if you're really trying to get the best black and white output. Great. And someone is asking if this will be recorded. It will be recorded and um, posted to our YouTube channel in a few days. And you should receive an email tomorrow with the recording here. Absolutely. Uh, so once you've downloaded that color profile on Windows, you guys have it really easy. You find where you saved it, you right click on it, and you select install profile and Windows will copy it into the appropriate folder. It won't look like anything happened, but it will be there. Uh, for everybody running the Mac OS, Apple has done a good job of kind of hiding the folder that these need to go in. It has to go into the library folder. And that, um, we have these instructions on our website, but from the finder, use the go menu. You can hold down the option key to reveal that folder and then navigate to it. And what I do often is I'll, I'll then take that folder and, and pin it to my sidebar. So when I need to come back to it, I don't have to go through the, uh, the search process every time. So you've calibrated your display, you've got your ICC profiles installed. And the second thing when printing is to set the correct paper type. So the paper type or the media setting is just as important as the color profile. Um, it adjusts ink density, print head height, paper feed, whether it's matte black or photo black paper, does the gloss optimizer or the chroma optimizer get applied. And what often confuses it, people is there's a limited selection of these media settings that are defined by the printer manufacturer. We as the paper company get to make profiles, but we don't get to change the media settings. So back on the download page on our website, if you're using, say, the Intrada Rag Bright on this, uh, I believe it's Canon photo printer, you would choose matte photo paper. Or if you're using the Juniper Brita, you would choose photo paper pro platinum. So when you go to download the profiles, I recommend taking a screenshot or printing out this page from our site with all the media settings for your printer. So in the future, when you go to print, you say, oh, I'm using the Juniper Brita. I have my profile, but man, I can't remember what that media type is. So it's right here, Photo Paper Pro Platinum. And the other thing that we do with all of our profiles is it, when you load the profile into Photoshop, you'll notice that it'll say Juniper Brita Rag um, Pro 10, and then it'll have some initials. In this case, it would be PPPP, four P's, for photo paper pro platinum or for matte photo paper, it would say MPP. So as you're more comfortable with the print process, you can use the initials at the end of our profiles as a little cheat for what, uh, what media setting do I use when I'm printing? So we'll jump in here. Is the profile applied when using the black and white mode of Epson and Canon printers? It, it, the color profile is not applied. Um, Epson has a setting called advanced black and white. Canon has a little checkbox that says black and white photo print, and those use the own, their own settings in the driver. So if you're doing that, then you still want to go back here and refer to our media type selections. So if you were making a black and white print on Juniper, though you might use the, the Canon checkbox for the black and white photo print, you're still going to want to choose photo paper pro platinum as your media setting because again, that controls the amount of ink and all that other stuff that's a good match for, for that specific Moab paper. We also have someone asking about, um, they just purchased the Moab sample box. Would you recommend printing the same image on all of the, the papers or different images on each paper? I definitely would recommend printing the same image on each paper because that gives you a sense of how does the gamut change and the shadow detail and the highlights and the appearance of the colors and, and all that sort of thing. Because if you have properly created profiles, which we definitely should, um, your colors will stay the same, but the characteristics of the paper will really shine through when you have the same image printed on many different papers. And is it worth it to have a separate printer with its own set of black and white inks? Again, that's if you want to go down the road of really high-end black and white printing, it's absolutely an option. There's a couple companies out there that make um, full uh, uh, monochrome inks. And typically you buy a new printer and you don't put any inks in it and you load it up with these special monochrome inks and, and work from that. Again, that's a definitely a, an inexpensive and time-consuming process to do. But if, it's, if you're a real connoisseur of black and white prints, that can be a great way to go. I, I have pretty limited experience with the um, 
with the black and white inks, although I have spoken with some people that that do it and 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 really love it. So if you again, if 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 that's a, a calling to you, then then jump jump in. Yeah, somebody says uh p piezography or piezo piezography, I don't know how you pronounce it, but there's a there's a company that does make those. I think it's the cone inks. And now we've, sorry, go ahead. I say now we've gone off track a little bit. So <laughs> bring it back. Um, do ICC profiles need to be updated like apps or are they automatically fixed? They don't. So ICC profiles, once you download it, it's uh, fixed. I have gone back on a limited basis and updated some of our older profiles because as the, the scanning technology gets better and the software number crunching gets better, we can create uh, better profiles. So on our website, you'll see at the top, if you have one of these older printers above where it, here, it says Moab paper and media type, there's a little note that says all profiles updated, you know, September, 2019. And then you could say, well, it's been a while since I downloaded, I should probably update them. But for the most part, especially with the last two generations of printers, what we put out is uh, pretty much as good as, as good as it can get. And so those profiles likely won't be updated. Do you have a um, specific process for printing test strips or is that something you typically do? Uh, we're going to touch on that a little further coming up. Great. So I think we've, I think we've pretty much gotten, oh, somebody says, have the media settings changed recently? Um, sometimes you'll update your print driver and you'll find out that the media settings might have changed in names a little bit, or sometimes they add things. For instance, Canon added a Barita media setting and a lot of folks emailed in and said, hey, are you going to change that for the Juniper? Um, generally, we don't because we've gotten a great result using, say, Photo Paper Pro Platinum for the Juniper. But that is something that I try to evaluate as it comes. And, and if that were uh, a better result, we'd, we'd update it. So you've got... Um, sorry, one more question. Yeah. Is the ICC profile depending on the driver of the printer? Uh, no, the ICC profile is is independent of the print driver and the software. You can actually you can print out of say Microsoft Word with a with an ICC profile. I'm not sure how good your results would be, but it's a it's a universal file type that's that's used in in any software that handles imaging or or color or any print driver. Great. We have a lot of questions about ICC profiles. So um, at the end, also, if we have some time, we can run back to these or Evan, you're going to provide your email address at the end. So you can always shoot Evan an email and uh, get the answers then. Yes. On those download notes, um, my, my contact info was in there as well. So feel free to email me with any questions that we don't get to. So now that you have your ICC profile and your media type, you can preview your image with soft proof and rendering intent. So these are two pieces. Rendering intent determines how out of gamut colors are printed. So those colors that we talked about that were outside of our color space or outside of the color space of the paper, how do those get condensed back in so they're not just uh, blank spots in our prints? So the two color space, sorry, the two rendering intents you're going to use when you're printing are either relative color metric or perceptual. So relative color metric takes the colors that we can't print and moves them right to the edge of what's printable. And if you have a lot of out of gamut colors, this can result in some abrupt transitions. So perceptual rendering exists because it takes all the colors and moves them around, keeping the relationships the same, uh, but avoids any sort of stair step at the edge of the gamut. Now, the difference is relative color metric is, is likely to give you a print that's closest to your screen. Perceptual, because it moves all the colors a little bit, might not 100% match even a calibrated screen because the software's adjusted the colors a little bit to keep everything the same. But then if you take that print and hold it you know, across the room and look at it, it should look visually accurate, even though it might be slightly different from the screen. So how do we judge or how do we tell well, you preview with a soft proof. So why do we soft proof? Well, looking at this, the, the solid is uh, our Juniper Beretta rag printed with an Epson P5000. That's the full color space that's available. And the Juniper is a pretty high gamut paper. And the Epson P5000 is a very high gamut printer. So that's kind of pushing 
what's available to us with inks and paper. But you can see in Adobe RGB, there's a lot of data out here, a lot of colors that we can't print one-to-one, -one, yellows and greens and purples and dark blues. So the rendering intent takes these colors that are out here in the, in the wireframe area and moves them in to the solid space so we can actually see them. And you can, you can look at this rendering intent and actually compare the two of them. So this is a standard test image that, that we use, and this is our original image. And then with, um, I don't have it noted here, with one paper on a printer, all the stuff in bright pink are colors that we can't print exactly one-to-one. -one. So how do we do a soft proof? So in Photoshop, you're going to go to the View menu, Proof Setup, and then Custom. And custom, it's a uh, classic Adobe here. Instead of it saying output profile or ICC profile, they call it device to simulate. So device to simulate is where you select your print profile, print profile, ICC profile, output profile. And then immediately below that, you have your rendering intent. Photoshop offers you four options, but we're going to stick to just relative color metric or perceptual. And then you're going to click OK. And if you're in Lightroom, there's a checkbox for soft proofing in the develop module, which then lets you choose the profile, more appropriately named, and your perceptual or relative uh, rendering intent. And so we're gonna switch over to Photoshop and do, a, do a, a demo of this real quick. And while you do that, can you just uh, quickly explain exactly what a soft um, proof is? Yeah, absolutely. See, there we go. All right. So here is an image that I just have open. So we talked about uh, the view menu, proof setup, custom, and that brings up our window here. So I have the Moab Intrada Rag Natural profile selected for the Epson P5000. We're going to do relative color metric rendering. And at this point, not much will change when we click OK. But then what we talked about was the second part of this is the gamut warning. So how do I know what is going to be out of gamut? We go back to the view menu, and the third section down is gamut warning. So when you turn that on, any color that's not reproducible one-to-one -one will show up. The, the Photoshop default is light gray. I've changed mine to bright pink, so it's immediately visible. But in this case, with this image, the deep red of the strawberries on a matte paper uh, will not print exactly the same. Now we can go back up to our soft proof and switch it, say, to the uh, Juniper Burrito we were talking about. And now you can see that because we're using a photo black paper instead of a matte black paper, even with the gamut warning turned on or turned off, everything in this image with that paper and that printer happens to be in gamut. So uh, what a soft proof does is it previews how your image looks through the lens of that output ICC profile. So are there colors that are going to change? What's out of gamut? What can I expect when I make a print? So that's that's the full purpose of a, of a soft proof. And it's not going to be exact, but it's going to be very close. And then somebody's asking here, can you discuss black point compensation? So absolutely, if we go back to the soft proof settings, you'll see here we have our device to simulate, which is our ICC profile, rendering intent. And then right down here, there's this checkbox for black point compensation. So if you select relative color metric as your rendering intent, which I generally recommend as a good starting point, what black point compensation does is it takes your shadow values through the profile and moves your shadow values up to the, to the maximum black of the paper. So with black point compensation turned on, you should get nice shadow detail in your prints. With black point compensation turned off, you'll likely get very dark shadows with, with not much detail. If you're using perceptual, again, because perceptual moves and adapts pretty much all the colors, you don't need to use black point compensation. It won't make a difference in the print. So it's just, if you're using relative color metric, always check that box for black point compensation. 
And whether you're printing out of Photoshop or Lightroom in terms of the soft proof and the image quality, they're, they're the same. Adobe, as far as I understand, uses the same software uh, in the background, no matter what Adobe application you're using. And, and, and yes, uh, Oliver asks, would you then change the paper if the gamut isn't correct? So that's an artistic decision that you'll make. You know, we use often a, a matte paper or a cotton rag paper because it's a little more subtle, a little softer surface. But if you're trying to print, say, a really saturated sunset, and a lot of those colors are out of gamut, unless you want a painterly sunset with a, maybe a little less gamut, you might switch that to the Slick Rock Pearl or the Juniper Barita that does have a larger gamut so you can really accurately capture all those colors. So if you have an image and you think, well, I'm not quite sure what I want to print it on, you can perform that soft proof using a couple different paper profiles and see how that image might change depending on what paper you use. And there's another question. Um, will there be a difference between relative color metric and perceptual if all the colors um, are in the gamut and, and either? There may be a very small difference, um, but it should be pretty subtle. And that'll okay. depend, I think, on on how much shadow detail you have and, and that sort of thing. And how will um, someone know which papers has a higher gamut to print on? So we'll touch on this a little further, but any photo black paper or uh, glossy paper will typically have a larger gamut than a matte paper because glossy papers reflect more light and they have more of a direct reflection. So uh, we see that as a little more saturation and a wider gamut, just based on how that paper reflects color. Uh, how do you fix out of gamma colors? So to fix out of gamut colors, uh, generally I leave that up to the rendering intent and the color profile, because your goal in editing that file is to retain as much color detail as you can until the end of the process. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we had a smaller gamut inks and, and to some degree, smaller gamut papers. So if you edited a file a decade ago and you eliminated a lot of colors to match the, uh, the output profile of that time, well, if you then go print that profile, print that file now, you'd be missing out on all those advances in, in color science and, and inks and all that sort of thing. So always, um, always adjust your files and we go back to the very beginning, you know, in Adobe RGB or Profoto RGB and work with the best file you can until you print it because let the, uh, let the software and the ICC profile do the, do the, the gamut calculations versus you trying to do it manually on your screen. Um, and then which drive, which drive should you be using printer driver or software driver? And when and why? Ah, uh, which driver? Let's see, I, I reset the chat. Um, so you'll always have to download the printer driver to run your printer. And then in terms of a software driver, I'm not quite sure um, what they're asking about that. All right, so we're back. Let's see, hopefully everybody is back online. So to finish up our, our talk about soft proofing, this was our original image file. This was the Moab Juniper Barita on the Epson P5000 we talked about, uh, large gamut paper, large gamut ink set. And then if we switch that to Intrada Rag Bright, which is a, a matte cotton paper on the Canon Pro 10, which has a smaller gamut in the inks, you can see from the soft proof differences, the out of gamut colors increase a bit on the Pro 10. So this is, again, like we said, it's a tool for evaluating papers. It's a tool for troubleshooting your prints. If you get a print where you think, gosh, that, that one red rose or whatever, it doesn't look the same. Well, there's a good chance that that red rose might be out of gamut on the, on the paper printer combination you're using. So just like it was in the soft proof, rendering intent is also something you'll pick in the print window. In Photoshop, it's in that first color management section after you pick your printer profile. In Lightroom, it's in the color management section of the print module. And again, just like with the Lightroom soft proof, you pick your profile and then either perceptual or relative rendering. 
So we previewed, and then as someone asked, you know, back in the darkroom days, we made test strips. Well, you can't really make test strips anymore, but you can make comparison prints and absolutely use the same image when you're making comparison prints. And, and if you want to, you can use a kind of a technical evaluation image like I've shown in a lot of these samples or just a, an image you've made that, that has a good contrast, good shadow detail, good highlights, nice color. You want something that kind of pushes the abilities of the paper and the ink. You don't just want a, a print that's all just mid-tones that will look good on, on anything. Ah, so here's somebody's in place of saying the driver, which do you suggest printer manages colors or imaging software manages colors? So in order to use one of our ICC profiles, you have to select software manages colors. So Photoshop manages colors, Lightroom manages colors, uh, you know, capture one manages, I don't know what their, what their text is. Cause if you say printer manages colors, then you've lost control over your output profile. So now that we've gotten this far, how do we select papers and how do we pick papers? So we'll, we'll break it down to make it a little, a little easier to understand. A matte paper, and we've all typically had uh, experiences with matte paper. A matte paper is simply an alpha cellulose or a tree paper with, with no surface shine. A rag paper simply means that the paper is made out of cotton. So our juniper brighta rag is a Barita paper, which is kind of a semi-gloss, but it's 100% cotton. Same with the Entrada Rag Bright. That's a matte paper that's 100% cotton. Uh, RC papers are traditional surface papers, glossy, luster, semi-gloss. Canvas sort of speaks for itself. Washi papers or Japanese papers, or some people call them uh, rice papers, but they're actually made from mulberry or kozo fiber. And then specialty papers are slick rock metallic silver, slick rock pearl, there's a lot of uh, specialty papers out now, things that we could never have used in the darkroom. So how do we select it? Well, uh, tooth and surface texture, detail, tone, saturation, cost. Obviously, cotton papers will be more expensive than cellulose papers. Do the papers contain optical brighteners? So we'll take a little pause here. Cotton and wood pulp are not inherently bright white in their natural state. So... Um, a number of papers, optical brighteners are added. And an optical brightener takes ultraviolet light and fluoresces it or reflects it back to our eyes as visible blue light, which makes a paper look whiter. Now, optical brighteners, the more UV you dose them with over the years, they kind of wear out. And if you hang a optical brightener paper in a south-facing window, that process is going to be fairly quick. If you frame it in a hallway, that process is going to be extremely slow. And as the optical brighteners kind of wear out, the paper doesn't change, the inks don't, don't change. The only thing that changes is the base color of that paper will start to appear a little warmer. Um, if you have our Entrada Rag Bright or our Entrada Natural, they're identical base sheets, except the bright has some optical brighteners in it and the natural doesn't. So there are many opinions out there on the web as to the value and longevity of optical brighteners. I think that if you like the look of a bright white paper, there is no harm in just printing on what you really enjoy. Keep in mind, if you are going to frame a paper with optical brighteners under a UV glass or a conservation glass, you're going to block pretty much all the UV. So you're going to turn that back into more of a warm white paper because you're blocking that ultraviolet light from hitting the optical brighteners anyway. So if you're going to submit your photos to the Smithsonian or, you know, sell your prints for six figures, then you might want to consider how optical brighteners factor in. But for the rest of us, I say pick the profile that that fits your work the best, or sorry, pick the paper that fits your work the best and, and go forth and, and enjoy printing. Um, personal preference is a huge thing when selecting paper. And how does that paper affect the image? We have a, a great toolbox here because we can use the look and the surface of the paper to influence the viewer when they don't even know that we're doing it. So again, uh, a foggy lake at sunrise, print that on a, on a cotton rag paper, and you're taking a subtle image and you're putting it on a subtle paper. So you're communicating to your viewer how that felt or 
you know, a, a race car or a rocket launch, you do that on the, the slick rock pearl or the slick rock silver, and you have a very intense high contrast image that you've put on a high gloss metallic looking paper and you're accentuating the qualities in that. So use the, use the characteristics of the paper to really communicate your feeling in the print. And the other question is, what are you going to do with the prints? Uh, the prints that I, that I give to my mother that hang on the side of the refrigerator, those go on exhibition luster because it's probably the most durable paper in the line. You know, you can fling a little pasta sauce on it, wipe it off and, and you're good to go. If you were to put a matte paper on your refrigerator and fling a little pasta sauce on it, it would, uh, it'd be more of a collage because you're never getting it off. And then again, as we go through all this, test the papers for yourselves, see, see how that works. Pick that in one image or two images, print it on a bunch of different papers and, and how does the paper affect the image? Is there a certain size uh, paper you use for the test prints or does it not matter? I like eight and a half, 11 because it's, it's a fairly inexpensive size, but it gives you enough look at the image to be valuable. You kind of think if you're, if you're doing a, um, if you're doing a, a four by six as your test image and eight by 10 is about, well, is four times as large. So if you have a quarter inch gradient, on a four by five, you're going to have, you know, a three quarter inch gradient on an eight by 10. So a slightly larger print gives you a lot more information and detail about the image versus a, a very small one. So that's why I'd recommend, um, eight and a half, 11 for your, for your sample prints. So the other question, how long will my prints last? Uh, the good news is that inkjet technology that's out now, is very durable. I think we have the best the best inks we've had in a long time. So to kind of break it down, uh, mini lab or drugstore prints, we would give those a, a short life. Unfortunately, these days, you know, the people running the machines generally don't understand the chemistry in there and how everything works. So you know, you don't know when the thing was last serviced or anything else. Uh, dye based inkjet prints, which are the cheapest photo printers and a lot of the all in one printers, we say those have a, a medium life. I think that the average is like. 30 to 40 years on a, on a glossy sheet uh, before things start to change. That's not your photo is going to look terrible. It's just when you'd start to notice that, hey, maybe the colors are fading a bit. Pigment-based inkjet prints. So most other inkjet printers, photo printers, are all pigment ink. And that is an actual particle of color in a, in a solution. Um, on RC or alpha cellulose papers, long life. You know, stored or displayed properly, 100 years, 150 years is, is what we're guessing. On a uh, cotton paper, even longer than that. You know, Epson is claiming upwards of 200 years. Now, how do we test this? Well, the methods are secret in, in the couple of companies that do this testing, but they make some color charts. They put it in a hot, humid room next to a very bright light for six months. And they say, well, that's equivalent to 75 years. How does it look? So it's it's not an exact science. Um, you know, we know that uh, gelatin silver prints from the darkroom are 130, 140 years. They're still looking pretty good. And, and, and as I always say, if you're really worried about your legacy, sell your camera gear, buy some oil paints, because we, we have on good authority that 500 years on, those are, those are still going pretty strong. Uh, but the bottom line is pigment inkjet prints these days, you can print without fear of, of that print falling apart. And how do I keep my prints lasting long? Again, the type of ink, pigment will last longer than dye. UV and humidity are the killers of photography and, and most artwork in general. So protect your, protect your images from UV, protect them from humidity. Store your photographs in the same environment that you like to live in. So don't put them in the attic, don't put them in the garage. Put them in the, in the closet, in the guest room or something like that. The type of paper, all of our mod papers are acid-free, lignin-free, neutral pH, that sort of thing. When you're handling your paper, especially cotton papers or matte papers, wear a pair of uh, just cotton inspection gloves or something like that to prevent the, the oils on your hands from transferring into that print. Use neutral pH, museum-grade or archival framing materials. A lot of inexpensive photo frames come with a backer sheet of high-acid cardboard, well, the minute you put that against your nice uh, neutral pH paper, the cardboard starts leaching acid into the paper and it'll pretty quickly yellow your photograph. 
And then finally, storage. Again, store your prints in an archival box or something else like that. If you store them in a leftover Amazon box or a plastic tote, those are not archival quality. They're generally high acid, and even the plastic can leach things into the paper. So make sure you're using an archival storage box. Or a lot of people ask, hey, if I have an empty box of Moab paper, as long as you have that clear plastic bag that came in it, you can let your finished prints off gas or dry for about 24 hours, put them back in that plastic barrier bag, and then put those in the original box and you're totally safe storing your prints in that, in that bag. Evan, do you have any suggestions for um, storing like larger sized prints? So the easiest way to store larger sized prints is to roll them up. Um, you can get plastic sleeve, archival plastic sleeve material. So if you roll up, you've got this eight or nine inch diameter plastic sleeve and you slide the print in there and then you can, you can set it down. That's, that's the most space efficient way. Obviously you can store them flat, but then you have to get very large archival bags and, and have a place to store them. So I'd, I'd say rolling, you know, rolling a print, especially a large print, there's no harm in doing that. You just have to have enough time to let it flatten out before you're going to frame it. And is there a fiber paper that you recommend with a durable surface for sharing by hand? Um, well, I would say a Barita paper is going to be the most durable sort of fiber paper with a, with a slightly semi-gloss surface. Um, any matte papers obviously will be somewhat subjective to scratching and, and, and scuffing and that sort of thing. So a couple people have asked about, about coatings. We make a desert varnish that is a protectant spray for matte papers. It gives it some UV protection, some humidity protection, a little scratch resistance. And if you're gonna if you're gonna spray your your matte prints, make sure that you are using a an inkjet spray instead of like an art lacquer or something like that, because often the art lacquers are not designed for inkjet inks and can have a chemical interaction. So you definitely want to use a specific inkjet spray for inkjet prints. Uh, what about a wooden map drawer for storage? Probably okay. I would line it with glassine or some other archival um, paper. Just to you, you don't want your prints in contact with something that you don't know is is archival quality. And is it okay to spray the rag papers? Absolutely, the rag papers or the matte papers. Again, it's not really necessary if you're going to frame them and use. An archival glass, but if you're going to put them in a book or in a, uh, a a presentation box or just have loose prints, then spraying them is a great way to, especially prevent them being, you know, getting fingerprints in the corners or or the corners or or that sort of thing. So again, extending your print longevity, UV glass, archival box for storage, watch your humidity, allow for drying or what we call off gassing. Up 24 hours is good before framing or storage. And then again, if you're going to leave your mat, your mat prints out to be handled, a protectant spray like the Moab Desert Varnish. Um, this is one of our swatch books. And then the Moab sample box. I think some people have brought up that they got one. It's two sheets of all of our papers. They're all labeled. It's a great way to get started kind of exploring the papers. Just download all the profiles you need and, uh, and want, remember to watch those media settings and, and give it a try. There is a, there's a book from one of our Moab masters, Lester Picker, over in the um, in the offers section. You can download that for free. He covers in depth a lot of the things that we talked about today. And then if you if you really want to go down the technical print rabbit hole, there's two other books listed here: Fine Art Printing for Photographers and the Digital Print that really delve into uh, you know dot placement and and print sharpening and, and a lot of more advanced topics that we uh, didn't have time to touch on today. So those are great sort of continued reading if you want to delve a little deeper and spend some more time. And another thing that I've added kind of at the end of this, especially now with, with all these subscription programs and, and updates and all that sort of thing, is you know our computers have become as critical as our cameras and our printers and, and all that sort of thing. So my little soapbox notes here are number one, when new software comes out, 
Uh, don't be an early adopter, which we also call an accidental test subject. Don't run out and update that thing the night it comes out, expecting it to work flawlessly. Make sure you read the, the fine print before you update, especially an operating system. Maybe what you're using won't work. Ask your friends and colleagues their experiences. And always, if possible, keep an older version as a backup. So if you update, for instance, Lightroom, it will then update your library and an older version of the program won't open the same library. So make sure as you're updating your Photoshop or your Lightroom or your Capture One or whatever else, keep a, keep a previous version of that software that you know works for you and works really well so that if there's issues, you can always go back to it. And uh, make sure you never update before an important event or a shoot or uh, printing for a gallery show or, or whatever else, because inevitably that will, that will cause headaches. So our, to kind of wrap up, and then we'll get to a couple final questions. Uh, take the time and have the patience to understand and get to know your printer. Test and evaluate different papers. Uh, become familiar with the printing process and with color management. Again, as you go through this, keep notes and, and keep those updated and, and don't lose your notes. Uh, and the biggest thing is ask, ask all these questions. So, you know, we're, we're all here together as a creative community and as a printing community. And, and sure, we sell paper and, and, you know, we appreciate when you buy our paper. But my job, my goal is to also be a resource to say, hey, I'm, I'm stuck at this point. You know, where do I go from here? I, I, I think if you have a, a printing or a photography question and you, you give yourself like a 10 minute timer and you do your web searches. And if, you're, if your question isn't answered in 10 minutes, you know, pull the ripcord on that parachute and, uh, and phone a friend, or if it's a printing question, send us an email or whatever else, because this, you know, we will all, uh, elevate ourselves on collaboration and, and there are no stupid questions in this. I still, from time to time, put the paper in the printer upside down and get a really interesting modern art print on the, on the back of a coated paper. So no matter how far we are in the process, we all still <laughs> make mistakes and, and use, you know, use this to, to, to make printing part of your creative process. So in the notes, you'll have uh, my emails in there. And then we also have uh, some forums and some how-to pages on our, on our website. So let's go Great. back here and see. So we do have a question um, asking if the Moab Screw Post album is available. And it is, that's our Flint portfolio. You can find it on our website, modpaper.com. Um, you can also find it through our resellers, which is listed on our website under the where to buy section. So uh, you can find it at any of those, any of our resellers. Um, we did also have a question. Where can you find the image to print to test color profiles? Uh, that test image. I don't remember where it came from. You can search for you know, inkjet printer test image, but make sure that you download or you locate uh, the 16 bit TIFF file and not a an 8 bit JPEG. There's a lot of those 8 bit JPEGs floating around on the web and those won't give you again as much data. The 16 bit TIFF gives you the full color and, uh, and brightness range. Right. And there was another one here. Somebody's asking my ASO monitor. So this kind of applies to any Adobe RGB monitor has its own calibration software, or do I use the calibrator software? You'd want to use the monitor software. If you have a, a 10 bit Adobe RGB monitor, because that's going to do a hardware calibration. And that's the advantage of those monitors. Um, Alan's asking about if, if you have a Canon printer, their new image program series, the 1000, 2000, 4000, you can make, we can make custom media files for that. And we will be doing that sometime this year. Their Canon's updated that custom media ability a lot and it's, and it's real stable. So we'll probably be doing that for some of our papers now, but it'll be a couple of months. And um, someone is asking about um, which double-sided papers that we have. Yeah. So for a calendar, I would say most of our matte papers are double-sided. We don't have the dual semi-gloss anymore, which was a double-sided semi-gloss paper. So you'd want to look at probably the Entrada, probably the Entrada 190. It's going to be a little lighter weight, but it's going to be, should be more durable than a, uh, than a cellulose matte paper. But then if you're doing a calendar, you probably do want to spray or coat those prints so that 
they don't rub on each other and and scuff as people are turning the pages and and flipping it back and forth, looking at all your at all your lovely uh, photographs. People have been asking about uh, image print rip for those of you that that uh, know what it is or are asking about it. It's a very good piece of software. Again, if it's if if you're doing a lot of printing and it would benefit you, absolutely. It's you know for those people that are printing more casually, it's it's kind of another added expense. So if it would help, it it is a great piece of software. And, and I, it looks like Jim Rosselli um, added a link to the uh, test image. So if you want to check it out in the chat, then it's linked there. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much for digging that up. Um, does it make any difference whether you print from a TIFF or a Photoshop file? It does not, as long as they're both you know, at the same bit depth. We just recommend a TIFF for archiving or for sharing files because TIFFs are sort of finalized version independent image files, whereas a Photoshop file, if you have layers especially and you send that to somebody with a different version of Photoshop or something else, that file is not guaranteed to show up at the end the way you see it on your end. So TIFFs are best for longevity archiving or for sharing files. 